this is Agency of Nigeria is there. They're great. Good morning. Good, good afternoon, man. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. And you, man? I am doing great. So be back. I'm happy. And happy birthday in Arias. Thank you very much. Uh, and we, we do we do hope that you 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 live to see the Nigeria of your dream because we know you have good plans for this one. Let's hope that um, this thing are carried out as we as we get along. We're trusting God for that. Yeah, thank thank thank, thank you very much, man. Um, I'll go straight to some of the things that are uh, pertinent. Gage Gage Life is it's a platform that we've um, created to help share development and spotlight some of the most interesting things happening in the tech in the tech space in Nigeria. And because we know that you have also used you've been able to use harness the power of technology to come up with interesting campaigns that have that has resonated globally. We we feel it's very important for you to share your experience so that we can be inspired and beyond us being inspired, we don't know the kind of flame you may spark from this conversation that can change the whole essence of what Nigeria is today. I think that what you're doing is uh, very important, and I think it's the power of technology um, enabling mm. conversations. Conversations mm. are very important uh, in maturing mm. democracy around mm. the world. Mm. 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 The more that people can talk, the better. Mm. Yes, yes. It, it, it has also given us a platform to have a little thing. Ma, um, COVID-19, how has it affected Africa and Nigeria particularly? Well, it's affected um, Africa in a very um, terrible kind of way. The injury that it has um, um, visited on Africa is uh, multifaceted. Um, I think that the first one is, of course, the health uh, a challenge, but in terms of the health um, morbidity, you can see Africa trails other regions of the world in terms of morbidity, and um, at least uh, at this time, and um, I, you know, I mean, I'm a person of strong faith, and I'm hoping that, you know, somehow, somehow, some miraculous way, we don't follow the pattern of other uh, countries in terms of the viral uh, the, the epidemiology of the of the of the virus and and how mm. it, you know it, it, it just takes it's that certain cycles of life mm. the viral life cycle follows a certain pattern which as we've seen whether it's in uh, Italy or Germany or the UK or the US um, mm. uh, just sort of gets to a place where community infection uh, or community transmission uh, takes mm. hold and then you can't you really can't hold it back. It just goes like an exponential growth of, uh, mm. of infection. And then you have to battle with that. We haven't seen that yet at that level on our continent. And I'm hoping that we don't get to that peak and then begin to say we're flattening the curve. Because in our own case, treatment is going to be impossible. We don't have the health system. We don't have the health infrastructure. We don't have the health personnel. Uh, we, don't, we simply don't have the protocol to be able to deal with overwhelming situations. Because even mm. underwhelming situations already overwhelm us. So uh, we, we don't want to get there at all. Uh, so that's on the health side. The, but, you know, the collateral is that we have had a, a, a shutdown of the global economy. And this is happening at a time when most of Africa is highly leveraged in terms of its uh, obligation on debt. Uh, there are ma many of the countries have borrowed to the maximum of debt sustainability and even gone beyond it. And so they have very slim fiscal space to be able to invest in the things that are necessary uh, to happen at a time of global pandemic that shuts down the global economy. So, um, you know, countries of the, of, of, of the, of the West and, and the East launched massive stimulus packages in order to uh, substitute for the collapse in, in the spending by private sector and by consumers. Uh, so mm. when that happens, the Keynesian theory says the government steps in. So the government has stepped in in most of these other economies, but our governments in Africa can only step in to a very miserable extent. And so mm. you see that the citizens are bleeding, they are angry, they are distraught, and, and, and so you can't even buy the compliance of the citizens. You know, the countries of the West and the East are buying, and even the Middle East mm -hmm. are buying the compliance yeah. of their citizens for the necessary isolation, the necessary shut yourself away from this so that we can mm -hmm. contain the spread. They were able to buy it because they have the fiscal space to do that. Africa does mm -hmm. not have that. And so when you look at the um, emergency economic measures that have been taken, they are mis they might be a miserly compared to 
the scale of needs that uh, uh, that that they should meet. And and then so the the, the, the third point, the third part of the crisis is then the social the social dimension of the crisis. Um, so uh, when people feel that economically their livelihood has been taken, especially the 70 percent that exists on subsistence income. In other words, yeah. if they don't work in a given day, they don't earn income and therefore they are not assured of living. And, and these ones are now angry because they're saying you shut down everything that we do in order to survive. Uh, I mean, in mm. the best of times, we don't even know that government exists. But it's worse when government now says to us, we're imprisoning you uh, so that uh, this virus would not get to you. So you now hear people who say to you, oh my goodness, I can survive coronavirus, but I can't survive hunger virus. And, and yet, you know, this kind of statement is made out of frustration because the real truth is that you've got to be alive in order to be hungry. Mm. Um, so, mm. um, so, so you have this this pattern of social angst, uh, uh, anger that is building up. And so it could create really significant social crisis on the continent. Mm -hmm. And certain uh, key sectors of the economies are shut down. The, the significant sector that determines food uh, is shut down. So farmers not being able to go to farm and the corridors of movement of food are not being um, accessible means that we're going to soon run out of food stock and then you can you can get into a food shock if you have a food shock if you have food insecurity that's now really going to be more than a triple uh, uh, you know one you're going to really have uh, too much you know that's throwing at the citizens all at the same time so this is the uh, periscopic uh you know uh view of what's going on on the continent at the moment it, it, it's, a, it's a pessimistic picture you have actually painted if, uh, do, is there any of the, um, is there any light you see in the, in the whole of this huh. you know i i have spent a lot of time thinking to myself surely there must be something that this is going to live in its wake that is positive and um you know one of one of the things that i say clearly is that 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 um well-known resilience of the of the of the of the african of especially of the the the, the nigerian generally of the african person i see that more and more in the sense that communities are rising to step in and to step up communities are discovering themselves and sort of saying you know what the community spirit must not be lost at a time like this this is the time when we really all should be doing things together and supporting one another so and you know you need this kind of community spirit ultimately in nation building and so mm -hmm. that 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 is something that we would yeah. try to mm -hmm. we would need to try to study uh, what happened during this period and then to build some system or structure around it because for the mm. nation building when you don't have covid uh, you need this kind of a community spirit you need this level of uh, connectedness of people you know uh, mm. in the in the society uh, the second thing that i see clearly is that people are realizing that you know for us to solve any problem in society we do need to have the collaboration between government, business, and citizens. So this partnership, when we talk about partnership, a lot of the times uh, people just think of it in, in very uh, 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 simple terms of saying, you know, the government calling private sector to meet him or the government having uh, sessions with civil society. But, you know, what we know of partnerships were properly deployed is that it unlocks so much uh, in terms of energy, in terms of knowledge, ideas, solutions. It unlocks resources for financing development. And so when you look at this tripartite uh, you know, kind of rearrangement of collaboration that we're seeing you know, in the course of COVID-19 across the continent, you can see that we're going to understand this collaboration better if we should spend more time understanding how it has worked this time around and how we do need to scale it. We do need to get it to the place where it actually uh, supports the emergence of 
a collaborative approach for solving problems. Mm. Um, mm. Because it, uh, studies show that it actually does work in societies. Societies solve problems faster when they can find this kind of seamless where the division of labor between government, private sector, and civil society are, are coming together with their different areas of competencies and reach, but doing it in a very collaborative way, it supports society's progress. So that's the second thing that I see. The third thing that I see is that people are now, you know, hopefully there would be some governments that are, that are awake enough to realize that um, the world as they knew it can never be the same. So there is a new normal. And so it's a wake-up call. There is a wake-up call that was necessary for our continent. Uh, you know, people easily lapse into complacency and just take every day as it comes. Well, there's no every day as it comes guaranteed anyway. It is yes. what, what COVID-19 has shown us is that you can gently be sleeping in your home and something from far away Wuhan figures a way to walk, to fly all the way and to come mm -hmm. to where you are seated. So yeah. we cannot pretend that we are secluded from the global externalities. Um, and, yes. you know, when these negative externalities hit, they hit the poorer and the weaker in a terrible kind of way. So you yes. see what has happened with the oil shock, the commodity shock in general, whether it's copper or it's gold, all of the, all of the commodity, um, you know, sales, which is the basis of mo most of Africa's budgetary expenditure, has collapsed. Mm -hmm. And so yes. that says to the governments and to the leaders of the continent, are you going to continue being complacent? Are you going to continue just living a life that is based on the rent from underneath the soil? Or are you going to pay attention to a new development paradigm and strategy that emphasizes what your people know in terms of developing your human capital and mm. en engaging in the, uh, the structural reforms that are necessary, that have been necessary for more than six decades, which people have been sleeping on. Well, uh, Amma, you were recently talking about um, the Chinese governor, uh, government um, having a kind of reparation package for Africa. Um, do you want to throw some light on this? And why do you think um, they, they are obligated to such um, a, a kind of compensation for Africa at this time? Well, you know, you, I, I think you're referring to uh, my article in the Washington Post. Washington Post, uh, in yes. Which I was making a, yes, I was making uh, the case that um, Africa has been injured by the uh, the, the lack of um, the, the, the lack of full responsibility uh, that um, mm. China should have taken for for the um, pandemic. Um, mm. So the point of my of my um, of my um, op-ed is that Africa constantly gets shut down uh, when uh, advanced economies, um, richer economies, more powerful economies behave recklessly and their reckless mm. behavior affects the world. When it affects the world and then affects Africa and take, takes, tumbles Africa's growth, Africa should not just in a quiet way always receive this as um, a necessary uh, impact. No, it's not a necessary impact. When mm. countries that are more powerful, that are richer, that uh, can, can actually do something to manage global risks well, mm. fail to manage global risks well, we should get to the place where we now insist that there should be a penalty charge for that failure. And so I am making the case that Africa, which has been injured in terms of its economic growth because of failure to manage this pandemic when it was yet an epidemic in China, uh, well, must be paid the compensation for that would enable it to get itself back quickly to the level of growth that it was at before mm. this took it to a place where Africa's growth is going to contract by the, the, the uh, GDP is going to contract by as much as 4%. And then yeah. unemployment is going to bourgeon you know, uh, 
So as much as, uh, you know, by an additional 20 million, which I think is an underestimation, uh, an underestimate mm. of the kind of mm. level of unemployment that we're going to yeah. see on the continent. And for yes. a continent that is struggling already with youth unemployment, that's a terrible thing. I mean, the continent could be up in smokes as a result of this, the situation we find ourselves. The truth yeah. is, we don't even know how far this is going to go yet in terms of mm -hmm. all of those impacts on the economy, the social impact, and the food shock impact, and the multiple other, you know, things that come in their way. So Africa better be in a place that is certain to the world that it has been injured. And when you are injured, you are liable to compensation for the injury. That's the point yeah. I make. Mm. I, I hope we do have the muscle to be able to push this through because it, it, it sounds very logical because um, we are always at the receiving end of this kind of global issues when we are not prepared for it exactly. Um, Ma, um, you, you, let's now talk about technology and how you've been able to leverage on the power of technology to drive um, some of your campaigns. We saw that um, bring, back of, bring Back Our Girls, BBOG, was one of uh, was a global campaign. I mean, just took off and it's a it's it's globally it's, it's a case study how that was it one how did technology help drive the growth and that there is the acceptance of that campaign and then was it successful um so you you know you're you're correct in saying that um uh, technology was at the center of um what we did with um, the campaign for the rescue of school girls who had been abducted from their secondary school in uh, Chibok, Borono State in, uh, uh, in April 2014. When the, 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 um, the, the abduction was announced, it wasn't on um, electronic media that I, that I got the news. It was, on, it was on the digital space. It was on my Twitter timeline that I saw the news coming out from uh, the BBC. And so when mm. I saw the news, I, I, was, I was like, no, this cannot be true. So what, what my response to BBC was verified, you know, it was after I, I asked them that question that my own mind woke, woke up and said, hey, Obi, it's BBC you're asking whether they verified the news that they put out to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you mm -hmm. know BBC? I mean, their internal yes. quality control system, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. would, um, would, would make it impossible for them to put out the mm -hmm. news without substantiating. So that yes. was when I then really got frightened and I became alarmed. And um, I, I started tweeting furiously uh, to, to call mm. attention quickly and to, to basically say to the, uh, to the mm. presidency mm. and to the government that, well, this news is out here, that this has happened to children uh, in their school in Bruno State. We must do a quick search and rescue operation so that we can find these girls and recover them immediately. And the reason mm. that I was that... The reason that I was that anxious and petrified at the same time uh, was because I just less than um, eight weeks uh, I had I had been at the center of the the um, uh, the, the uh, 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 a, a demand for government to respond to what happened to the boys who were killed in their secondary school, the federal government yeah. college in yeah. Buni. Yes. They had been, mm -hmm. they had been brutally. Uh, murdered and they were burnt. Their chair remains were were used to taunt, you know, uh, the, the 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 people of this country by the terrorists, uh, and 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 basically uh, nothing happened. And I thought, my goodness, how could nothing happen? I was campaigning mm. at that time of the Boni Yadi incident in February that the government needed to to decisively respond to the uh, uh, to the terrorists in order that mm. they would understand that we were not prepared to negotiate the lives of our children uh, with, uh, uh, with them. Uh, they, you know, it wasn't going to be a choice of uh, either you, 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 you go to school or you die, or you, mm. you stay away from school and you stay alive. We shouldn't mm. be in this kind of a negotiation with uh, terrorists. Mm. This would be like killed in this kind of a way, this gruesome kind of death. You were going to just ignore mm. it and throw a party a few days after. I was very incensed by it, and my tweets were really going to the heart of the of the of the necessity for government to be accountable mm. for the death of those boys. So for me, so for me, the painful thing was that after a while, I had to move on. I had to move on to other things. 
when you know uh, you know uh, some some days afterward but i moved on with a, a lot of pain in my heart because i thought to myself how can i come from a society where it's now acceptable for children to be killed in their school and for nothing yeah. to follow and for it to just be like it was it's normal how we normalizing it i was saddened by it you know and and i spent many days being counseled by my husband to you know to to get me out of the emotional crisis that 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 yeah. really put on me because I, i i thought i felt no we shouldn't be so disempowered that we can just move on like this and and the government does nothing and then i i i, I talk for a couple of days and that's it that, you know i felt really i didn't feel good about myself you know either you know so um so so but, but, so when chiba girls happened it just evoked you know that memory of of the boni yadi boys in a bad kind of way for me i was filled with pain i was i was filled with sadness that hey look at our society again we've left our children now not 29 as those boys were in the boni yadi school but in their hundreds and i thought mm. what what's happening to the nigeria that i grew up in i was sad i was i was aghast you know so i i therefore use my uh, my twitter handle Uh, to to do a lot of um you know uh, uh, mm. uh, campaigning uh, for for mm. them people don't realize that the first couple of days i uh, they had stuck that i first had was where are our 85 daughters you know that was the first hashtag i had hashtag where are 85 daughters that was because mm. the military uh, after after many days that he didn't say a word when it eventually spoke the first thing it said was we have found all the girls uh, uh except uh, 85 of them uh, it turned out eventually that they hadn't even found anybody that they you know mm. that the girl a few of the girls that escaped escaped by run you know just jumping off the trucks that were mm. carrying them off from their from the town where they had been abducted mm. and and so mm. um it wasn't until the 23rd of april at the unesco book event where i was a co-host that we raised the matter of um, you know uh, i asked the the audience to stand in solidarity with chibogans and to say bring back our daughters and a young man mm. a lawyer who had, who was mm. listening to my speech at the event because it was a live broadcast then tweeted and said uh, obvious x says bring back our daughters bring back our girls and then i mm. retweeted him and told everybody please join us and declare to the world and to our government hashtag bring back our girls bring back mm. our daughters and then i continued mm. to tweet bring back our do- uh, daughters bring back our girls and then i said okay everybody adopt bring back our girls and mm. you know because I, i i had a large following already on twitter at that time many people mm. began to uh, began to tweet mm. and um, mm. before you knew it it went viral and so for the mm. next couple of days until about the 30th when a parallel initiative that was going on online uh, on on the email on a, on an email list serve that brings a lot of nigerian women together was saying that it, w- it would make a lot of sense to do a match to 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 do a physical match uh, to call attention to the plight of the girls and so yeah. that particular initiative then came together with the fact that we already had this online initiative saying bring back our girls adopted the team we bring back our girls and the match was fixed for the 30th of april and so that match as we advertised it online and and uh, on twitter on social media and every other way possible the rest of the world had already that that was already tweeting away bring back our girls then decided that oh well cities would also host physical matches so it was the social media that went ahead of the physical mm-hmm. match but by doing the physical match it now really brought it home to people who were mm-hmm. not on social media and and so mm-hmm. the, the combination of social media and physical action on the ground made sure mm-hmm. that the, it just grew uh, further and further and then the insistence by all of us who uh, started off uh, that match on the tattoo that we were not going to stop until action was taken to bring those girls back meant that we mm. committed to coming out every day uh, to demand for them and so we were doing mm. our online uh, our online tweeting but we were also coming out at a certain time of the day every day uh, to match mm. for them 
and and because mm. of that it just kept growing and 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 so the technology was really very much at the heart of what i call amplification you know yes. what uh, what technology does for you is that it supports exponential growth uh, if, mm. you know uh, if, if if we have just simply done physical matches in nigeria without any link into social media it would simply be a nigerian news but once mm. you are uh, on the blogosphere once you are on the on, on the web what what you have is that the world is your oyster Yes. So, so, so it means that just um, the technology, yes, technology played a major role in it. Also, there was a, there was a physical activation of the campaign theme, Bring Back Our Girls. And a combination of these helped grow this and became, um, is, was it successful? So, I mean, I don't, I don't know how you define success, uh, but yes. uh, the way that we, the way that we see the campaign is that the campaign was a very, very important action of citizens in this country and that's what people uh, see it as that citizens finally got to the place where a, a, an issue that did not directly concern them the citizens could build a, 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 a sense of collective effort around it and to say you know what there is something called shared humanity and there's something mm. called the social contract that government has with citizens these two principles came into activation uh, mm. by, by the fact that we as citizens, I mean, the people that gathered hardly, you know, I mean, I didn't know 99% of the people that I that I met at, uh, that came out to, uh, to, to, to be part of the campaign, uh, whether on social media or the, 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 the ones that we did on the ground. Most, of, most people didn't know themselves. They simply met there. And, and so this movement grew as a spontaneous movement coming out of citizens' action. And, and so that mm -hmm. in itself is a success uh, to the extent that you no longer had a situation where citizens felt unconcerned about things mm -hmm. that affected their fellow citizens. So that's one. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that people always say that had the, 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 the um, Bring Back Our Girls movement not insisted of, on for action to happen concerning the girls, it would have just typically petered off as it, as it, it, it is wont to do in our society. And many, many tragedies have occurred. I just told you about the uh, Boni Yadi boys. Those tragedies would yeah. occur. People would just read it and then shrug for 24 hours yeah. and then move on yeah. to other things. But because mm -hmm. we, we have the staying power to say we want action, concerning uh, the, 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 the Chiba girls, then it forced and compelled uh, at the kind of action that followed. So it's, it, that mm. in itself, it, you can call it success, that it compelled mm. those with the authority and the legitimacy and the power to act, to actually begin to act. Now, acting mm. is one thing, being successful in the action is a, an entirely different thing. So mm. people then say, that the fact that ultimately the government uh, they, they, uh, uh, then acted because government is a continuum. So I don't separate uh, government when they were abducted from government when they, you know, after they they, uh, they they were abducted and all of that. Yeah. I simply say government yeah. where where yes. where regime in in our advocacy mm. we've been consistently administration mm. neutral. I, mm. you know, yes. so 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 that that consistency enormously helped us to compel the action towards success because ultimately we, we our staying power meant that uh, the government had to take some steps uh, that resulted in uh, having 107 keyboard girls back but then of course yes. it was 219 girls that were taken so we're still missing 112 girls and we're also still missing the Charibu who was the only girl left behind after another incident of, um, of, of abduction happened in Dapchi, um, uh, uh, Yobe, is it, uh, Yobe State, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, 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 so here we are not having 112 girls and not having Leah Sharibu and a couple yes. of other aid workers that are still with the terrorists. So, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of success, uh, I don't like it as a, as a word. Because the the what we what 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 what, no, what, no. what should be successful, what you should call success is that no child 
is under threat in our society. That's when we can say we are a successful society. Where no child that goes to school mm. is under threat of, of losing their lives, of, of, of mm. losing their freedom, their liberty. Mm. Uh, that for me is what is success. So, um, you know, uh, I think that um, we, we, have a, we have a society that's broken. We have a broken society. Uh, and, and a broken society cannot be called a successful society. So yes. I, don't, I don't want us to, to make success about BBOG. BBOG is not important. What's important yeah. is, is that the lives of our children can be assured and guaranteed. And, and, yeah. and then finally, uh, and in line with what I've just said, I, I, I feel sad that it is because Chiba girls are considered to be the children of the poorer segment of our society. That we that we have had this long drawn uh, kind of uh, experience uh, with their with their suffering, you know. Uh, because I mean, the truth be told, the the political class they know exactly how to take care of themselves. If their children had been in that school, I doubt that I would have needed. Up here, supposedly, would not have needed to go out mm. on the streets to carry placards. They would have acted. I, you know, I, I would bet anything that our political class would act had their children been, the, if, if, that, if there had been this school that their children were rad and their children were taken amongst those girls, it would have, it would have spawned a different kind of re response from government. And that hurts me deeply. It hurts me deeply because I don't want to come from a society where your security is indexed to your social status. Yes. Where, where it is indexed to your to your income, where it is indexed mm. to your power or to your or mm. to your okay. to your influence. Uh, I just okay. I, I, I believe that a, a true society is a, a real society is really a society where 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 everybody is guaranteed security and guaranteed mm. equality of opportunity. Yeah. Mm. So so we saw oh, we saw I, how... I, you know it's you see one of the things that, 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 that is very sad. So I can read somebody who is saying, I'm bored with the security top pick of Chibok girls. That's a Nigeria. Mm. That's great. So when you say, what are the barriers that we see to, uh, to get into that? The number one barrier is digital infrastructure. Digital infrastructure, the necessary backbone that, you know, really underpins the kind of uh, uh, integration and reach and, and access and availability that, that you know, the, 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 the digital uh, uh, world can, can, can offer mm -hmm. citizens is limited. It is limited because it is concentrated within the urban cities and even within the urban cities, the grade of the physical infrastructure, uh, the, the, the digital infrastructure, the backbone, uh, is, is still not at the level of solidity and strength and, and performance and efficiency as should happen. Even today, when you and I are in this kind of a program, we're not optimizing because the quality of our, of, of our connection is still fragile, it's, it's very poor. So until we invest in the physical, that the digital infrastructure that would facilitate our interconnection and our reach, we would not be able to uh, say that we are at a place of efficiency. Because when you look at uh, speed, speed is a, is a function of productivity. For as long yes. as uh, our technology and, and our digital format is not giving us the kind of uh, the, the, the level of speed that uh, the, is, is, glo is the global average of, 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 of um, internet speed, uh, that we were way below it. I think we're uh, from, from the last uh, numbers that I had checked, we were, we were, at, we were significantly more than 80% below global speed. Uh, in, in terms of uh, internet speed, right? So that's something to deal with. Now, when you when you add the fact that a lot of our citizens are still in rural communities and the rural environments do not make a market case for the private sector to mm. offer, uh, you know, tele te uh, digital services. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what must happen is that the government has to step in when there is a market failure. That it is government that must step in. So rural mm. infrastructure to support the kind of backbone that we need in order to provide uh, digital content to the mm. to the rural communities. And this mm. is 
the, the rural communities are also where we have, uh, other than urban poor, that the real poverty is uh, incidented within the rural communities of Africa. And so we need to invest massively in the kind of infrastructure that would support the emergence of digital services in, in uh, the rural uh, community enclaves of, of the continent. The second part of it is, uh, you know, uh, digital platforms, just the platforms that carry the content of what it is that you want to convey. You know, I mean, look at, um, you know, digital platforms for, for commerce, for example, they are still in novelty on our continent. Uh, well, now that we see what COVID can do, uh, hopefully what's going to happen is that we're going to realize that a lot of our lives would be spent online. And so we better begin to build, uh, you know, at, whether they are at micro level or macro level platforms that that enable us to convey uh, uh, the messages and and the things that uh, and also to trade, right? So uh, mm. that 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 would help enormously to expand the scope. And then uh, mm. the, the the third thing is the, the poor the poor level of um of, of, of digital financial inclusion. So digital financial services is something mm. that is lacking a uh, very much on our continent and and so what mm. what's going is that in, in in the in the in the time of orthodox banking it was also difficult for for banks to establish um, their branches all over the country even when they were mandated many times the central bank or uh, of any country would set a, a, a goal for how many branches would need to be set up, but the banks were always underperforming. In the same way, uh, as, as now that we're, we're going digital and trying to use um, technology to create financial inclusion, we still have barriers to that. A key barrier is, uh, you know, the forms of identification. Identification is a, has been a major problem for our continent, sadly, and mm. yet technology is a solution to that problem mm. of identity. Because, mm. uh, you know, the unique identity uh, that enables a person to become a part of the digital, uh, the digital uh, financial services is something, that, is something that we would need to invest in. And we haven't mm. yet invested in it as much as we should. And the fourth mm. point is that there is, a, a, there is a vast body of public policy that is very necessary. Public policy is at the heart of um, uh, showing readiness to migrate from, from you know, uh, one, one level of understanding of, 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 of issues of development to another, a higher level of it. And our public policy is trailing technology. It is way behind the curve of the, the rapid expansion of technology. So you have a situation where people who are technophobes are the ones who are making policies around issues of technology. You're going to have a problem because they don't mm -hmm. see the, how, how important it is to, to be in a hurry. We must be in a hurry. Our policies, our laws have to reflect that. I know that at a certain level, like so one, one person who did very well in, in, in running technology in, in our country was uh, Omobola Johnson. She was an effective minister of technology. Uh, how far that has gone is uh, left to conjecture, but I don't think that there's been a, a noticeable um, amplification or in, in improvement in, in where, she, where she stopped. You know, so, so technology is so rapid and our policies must... Does it prepare us for innovations? Can we come up with solutions, local solutions that we have go global, go, I mean, people can adopt it globally. Is, does our educational system prepare us for this kind of, um, uh, of um, activities? So our educational system has, um, has, has is, is stuck in a rut. Uh, I saw that when I was um, Minister of Education and when I saw how totally delinked from what was going on with the rest of the world our education system had become, that was how come we launched a massive, massive, um, you know, reform agenda. In fact, we called it crisis in education. And out of that crisis, we were going to turn into opportunity. And so one of the things that um, we did uh, as far back as 2006, 2007, when I was Minister of Education, was that I entered into partnership with um, with um, uh, uh, organizations like um, Intel, 
Oracle, mm. uh, Microsoft, uh, Cisco, in order to set up academies in Nigeria. Mm. They were quite excited that there was this Minister of Education who was going ahead of her, her time uh, and, and, think, and seeing the, the value of technology. They were quite excited. We had MOUs to start those kinds of academies in order that um, even uh, the curriculum would now uh, be mainstreamed into the curriculum of our, of our school systems from the very basic level to secondary level and then to uh, what we, we, we also innovated something called uh, uh, innovative, uh, uh, let me remember, uh, it, we, we call them uh, the innovative enterprise institutions, innovation enterprise institutions, as well as um, uh, vocational enterprise institutions. This was a way of building a massive stock of skills. So because skills uh, really, one, uh, just going through the school system as it's traditionally formatted does not give skills. So we decided that we're going to have a system of building massive skills for the country. Uh, you know, the technology sector was taking off through the telecom sector. That was when we had done the um, auction. And so the, the all these uh, the telephone companies we know today were coming into existence. And as Minister of Education, whereas my, my products were coming out and not finding jobs, I was seeing these telecom companies bringing in truckloads of people from South Africa and all and um, all, all kinds of countries uh, and calling them engineers when I knew that the only engineering they, they, they had was the, 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 the title that was put to them and that they, they have just been given six months of training. And I thought I could also give our own children six months of training and prepare them to be technical uh, people that would work in the in the emerging economy of uh, technology. And so we, we we that was why we innovated. That was why we innovated the uh, the the, the um, innovation enterprise institution, the vocational enterprise institution, and and so the, all of that was toward upgrading where we were. Where, where we were in terms of education content. And then we engaged in a massive, a massive uh, reform agenda for the curriculum. Uh, the curriculum used to be something that was decided by ministry officials. I, I changed it around and I, and I brought in the private sector to help us determine the content of our curriculum. Because I, I said to the education uh, ecosystem at that time, that wait a minute, we're not producing our our graduates or, 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 or at any level of education so that we can keep them and cuddle them and carry them. There is a market test for our products. Now our products are being rejected by the market. That's why they are not getting jobs. And so we called it the warehouse syndrome, where we produced in order to put on the shelf in the warehouse because nobody was was taking them. And, and so mm. we, we decided that together with the private sector, we were going to change education in the kind of way that it would be very market oriented without compromising the necessity for people to be trained in values, in the humanities and in the basic knowledge of how to be decent people, uh, uh, you know, mm. that build society together. So, 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 mm. so yes, um, you're right in saying that our education system does not reflect a readiness to embrace the digital, uh, uh, you know, future or the di digital present, as the case may be. But the truth mm. is, it was not always supposed to be like that. As Minister mm. of Education, uh, with the, the kinds of reforms that we did, would if they had continued those reforms, there is no way, there is no way we wouldn't have become an emerging economy kind of education. I'm going to call you back because we need to have. Uh, a closure on our discussion. It's, it's very interesting because I have a few more questions for you that are very interesting. Ma, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. We appreciate you. Ma, so I was I was just talking about the fact that um, today uh, we used to know that the press is the fourth arm of government. And uh, it, it, it has created, um, and the press used to be a pressure point in government. And we, can, we, we now see Donald Trump has gone beyond the press. He, 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 he used his Twitter to make his voice heard because he doesn't believe so much in the press. It shows that the social media and the digital platform has created, it's now just as important as the press because we, we all now have a voice. So how do we mobilize 
and use this fourth arm because now we now have the, the social media, the digital space fighting with the press media as the fourth arm of government. How do we mobilize this arm of government to create social change, the kind of change we desire as a, as a nation? We, we are really frustrated with the, with the system. Some of us, we've logged out. We are just like, we are tired of it. We are living in our own world now. But how do we now use this fourth arm that we have created now as a voice for change? I, I think that what we haven't done well is that we haven't been able to um, we haven't been able to find a conscious and selfless middle class that is interested to pay the cost of building a social movement. Uh, you know, people people want somebody else to do it for them. They they think mm. they, they they think they think they have better things to do than than, mm. than, than to advocate for 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 a good society. They believe that um, they are entitled to a good society uh, that is that happens uh, because others fought for it, you know. So and and that it doesn't work that way, you know. So we we do have uh, to have a critical mass of uh, middle class uh, who uh, leverage their their privilege, uh, you know. First, they have to recognize their privilege, and then they have to leverage their privilege. Uh, in a willingness to to sacrifice for the greater good of society, uh, they must mm. see that um, it's not even a sacrifice as much as it is, you know, being um, uh, enlightened in their in their self interest. Uh, the the middle mm. class uh, would would benefit the most in a society that works because they would um, they they have the skills uh, to be able to take advantage of opportunities as they begin to emerge so and then the the middle uh, the middle class would also understand that the the privilege that it has uh, places a responsibility on it to ensure that society does not disintegrate uh, uh, because of poverty if poverty is um, rife uh, it becomes a destabilizing factor for society mm. and therefore it, it would constrain the middle class uh, I think that we have an irresponsible uh, middle class uh, in, in, in across the continent, uh, a, yes. a middle class that 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 has not uh, just risen up to take responsibility for the state of the continent and the state of the countries uh, that that mm. they, they are born into. Uh, the, when mm. when that happens, you, you you what you would say is that people would have collective action success, right? Uh, but but mm. for as long as people are looking at this matter from the perspective of uh, me and my family, uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, so we, we must create a, a momentum around a, a middle class that, that, that is ready to, to put down its gauntlet and to say mm. having good governance is important. Uh, without good governance, I mean, it, it, the evidence abounds that without good governance, no society has been able to get to development. And, and so mm. well, we can we can cry until the cows come home, uh, but you know the truth is it's not going to happen until we get yeah. good governance. <laughs> and the path to mm. good governance is through democracy, uh, because no mm. matter how hopeless a democracy is, it is still better than any other form of government, uh, because yes. democracy <laughs> in, 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 in itself carries the seed for innovation, uh, for mm. liberty of thought, and uh, you know for freedom. Uh, to, uh, to to think ideas, you know. So democracy is crucial. The issue, the, the question is, how do we make democracy work? We must make mm. democracy work. There's a there's a democracy deficit in our democracy. That democracy mm. deficit that is in our democracy is that our people haven't quite understood that they are actually uh, the ones that should demand and set the standard mm. of quality of governance that they yes. want. They think that somehow, if they if they can pray long enough, suddenly uh, a, 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 a political class that has no incentive to do the right things will just wake up one day and begin to do the right things. No, it doesn't work like that. You must compare the right kind of action that you need from those that govern. Um, so that's number one. Number two is that the quality of people who, who uh, populate our political space today leaves much to be desired. Um, there is almost a, a rule of nat natural selection where our mm -hmm. politics naturally selects the low, lowest of the mm -hmm. barrel uh, to, 
to, to, to, you know, to, to bubble to the top. Um, you know, so you look at uh, the quality of uh, political actors, whether at the federal level or at the um, local level or state level, and you have to say to yourself, is this the best that we can do? Is this the best quality of people? You know, the truth is, if you don't have quality leadership, you're not going to get good governance. Quality mm. leaders are important. Quality leaders in terms of their competence, in terms of their character, meaning their values on which they are anchored, and then in terms of their capacity to actually uh, think through and carry, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 solve problems. So we, we are struggling in that regard. Uh, so when you look at what technology can do for us, number one thing that I think we can do is uh, we have to invest in as much data as possible to show the middle class how foolish they have been uh, to assume mm. that they have a better life. They don't have a better life. They are just a, a check away from poverty. They are one mm. health disaster away from poverty. So to pretend mm. that because they have a car, their uh, children are in private school, they are better off, they can ignore governance. That is, they are, they, you know, they are, it's, so, it's self-defeating. Uh, uh, and, and we can use data to show to the middle class how, you know, uh, the, their quality of life has consistently been declining because of their lack of interest in, in ensuring that there is good governance in the society. Their quality of life will keep declining for as long as, you know, governance is not delivered. Yeah? So, so do you want your quality of life to decline to the point where you also now drop into poverty? Uh, that, that's a question that the middle class would need to face. By the time you use data analysis or visualization to show them how badly they are doing themselves while pretending that they are okay, you know. And then you can also use data to, to show the middle class how it is that if the middle class, if the society, if the demand side for governance actually took foothold uh, very well with their, with their action, with their engagement, that what would happen is that you would have good governance, especially good economic governance, and that you would have sectors of the economy that would become so important and become major contributors to economic growth, and that they would be the beneficiaries because their competences and their skills would be in great mm. demand, and their ideas would produce because productivity and competitiveness will become the, 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 winning, the winning factor. All right, the game changer in that kind of an, a, a new environment, right, of good governance, mm -hmm. and that the middle class would be able to compare, uh, would, it, would be able to compete with their global peers, right? Yes. And so you need to give them an incentive for wanting to to work towards good governance, and data can prove that. You know, so we need to use uh, technology uh, to then take this to, to do this whole data work and then use technology to, to distribute this information <laughs> to, the, to the middle class because we know exactly where to find them. Technology tells us the spaces where they are, so we can use technology to get to them. So it becomes, you know, you solve the content problem by generating a, a, a quantitative data and, trans, you know, tran, translating that data or, or interpreting that data in the way that it is meaningful. And then you do the delivery of the of the information to, to the source or to the target audience. So that's that's a big role that technology can help us play in, in conveying technology oil. Which of them has the biggest potential in the long run to take Nigerians out of poverty? Isn't the answer very obvious? What has oil done for Nigeria so far? There's mm -hmm. no, if there were, if there were promising oil, we would have already seen it. You know, so we mm -hmm. missed the boat because what oil was supposed to do for us is that oil was supposed to be, um, you know, God's way of giving us um, more resources. Mm -hmm to move ourselves mm. from one level to a higher level. Because usually, when a country uh, needs to do development, one major component for development is the stock of investment you're able to do in things like your critical infrastructure, your human capital, the institutions that you need. Now, when you have oil or you have copper, or you have any of these kinds of commodities that you know you didn't work for 
they, it's just like a you know a, a lottery ticket you you got the right lottery ticket and your number was called and and then mm. you, you run into this big money that that you weren't uh, envisaging that's what oil does for people so what you those people when they are sensible would normally do is that they would take that pot of money and they would invest it they would translate it from raw cash into world-class human capital you mm -hmm. your friends in the technology world our medical doctors in the front line of this COVID-19 response, mm -hmm. our scientists, uh, you know, our microbiologists who are doing a lot of the work, you know, understanding this virus and, you know, providing the kind of analytics around it, world human capital. So oil money invested in quality education, in yes. education that, 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 that produces the right kinds of, uh, you know, human capital would be the education that 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 you know would be the out the outcome of good investment of oil resources right the second good investment of oil resources would be that we invested in critical infrastructure so that whether it's in terms of uh, road networks we're connecting the rural roads to the urban roads so that we are integrating the markets so that our farmers in the villages would actually gain the benefits of being farmers. Their household income would be higher than it is today. They would have low store, uh, you know, spoilage effect. And so in infrastructure, infrastructure in terms of water systems, uh, if we have water systems and sanitation, we reduce the probability of uh, health burdens uh, by a measure of more than 40% you know, with uh, access to water and sanitation, you know, um, mm -hmm. investment in infrastructure in terms of the important backbone uh, of, say, the transmission system for energy sector so that the power sector, where the private sector enters into generating power and enters mm -hmm. into distributing power, and then the transmission of power is less uh, amenable to market, and government steps in and provides that backbone, you can now get mm. those three segments working in a seamless way and providing the kind of access to power and the availability of power that that enables our businesses to be competitive, you know, so, you know, and uh, to be highly productive. Um, and then it enables our, our, uh, our, our citizens uh, to have the best quality of life, right? In mm -hmm. Investment in infrastructure, like what we were discussing about technology, uh, the backbone yes. uh, is something that is mostly requiring um, a, a risk capital. And uh, there is a level of risk that the private sector cannot take. And that's when we say market failure has happened. Mm -hmm. So there is certain, you know, ex uh, what you call it, last mile investment in backbone that has to be done by government. So that when you take oil money and you put in those, those kinds of things, that is a good translation of oil money. But we didn't do mm. this. We took our oil money and we behaved like the prodigal son. And, mm. and you can see, it, it's a prodigal son, not a prodigal daughter that was talked about. So that tells you yeah. something already. You know, yes, um, uh, now I'm uh, now I'm uh, now I'm 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 I'm, I'm giving a snipe to the men. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so 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 we so we we instead have behaved yeah. like a prodigal, uh, uh, like the prodigal son, and we have invest we haven't invested the proceeds from oil into those things that I have spoken about world-class human capital, quality infrastructure to create an ecosystem of low low, uh, low uh, barriers to, to business, low, low barriers to productive activities. You know, so mm. we have ended up, therefore, with consumption. Mm. We consume yes. most of what mm. comes from oil. So mm. how is it that you get out of this? How you get out of this is that you need this political action that changes the quality of people who are thinking about policies at a political leadership level. Otherwise, if you don't change it, all you're going to have is the same same. The current political class 
it doesn't matter what political party they belong to, their, their operating system, that's the OS, right? Their OS is completely, you know, designed for consumption. They are not going to change this paradigm. Nothing you say mm. is going to change. Every, every group that is coming replaces the previous group as, because they see politics as a game of transactions. So you're not never going to get a different outcome. What um, what um, you know Einstein says is that you cannot um, you know continue with the same thing that you've done over and over again and somehow in a crazy manner expect to get a different outcome. It ain't gonna happen, you know. So so since we know that, we must make sure that we all work toward political change so that the political change would bring for us the kinds of political leaders who understand that, look, Nigeria can thrive without oil. Nigeria can already begin to transit from an oil-dominant kind of, um, you know, governance, because frankly, oil, oil significance in our economy has reduced, but oil significance in our governance has not reduced. Now, let me explain that. The federal budget, the state budget, that the money that we spend as government is still more than 80% of oil money. So we're not generating non-oil revenue for government to invest in the things that government should deliver on. But mm. when you think in terms of the composition of our economy, oil oil as a composition as as a, a component of our economy so if you look at our gdp of about 450 billion or thereabout depending on what uh, exchange rate you use to to calculate the gdp if mm. if you look at that that stock of gdp of goods services and everything in between that you call gdp if you look at that and you look at what percentage of it is oil sector, it is now less than 15%. Mm -hmm. In the past, it used to be significant. It used to be mm -hmm. huge. But we now mm -hmm. have, you know, um, services. Although services uh, in the form of low productivity services as more, it's something in the neighborhood of some 51% or thereabout. Then you get agriculture at about 23%. Then you have telecom sector and you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, things like, uh, uh, like uh, which is the other thing, it's oil, it's construction, it's uh, telecom, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, the agriculture. I've spoken about that. So you can see that mm -hmm. in terms of composition, of the economy mm. oil is mm. not that significant but in terms of you know the uh, the the, the mm. revenue government, of government, government it is very significant in it, it, is it an aberration the, in terms is it of an aberration or is it wrong pardon is it an aberration this kind of disparity or is it a norm it is, it is it shouldn't be a norm you know because um the the uh it, 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 what should have happened is that if, for example, our services sector, uh, which is um, uh, some 51%, were high productivity services sector, then the taxes from that sector, you know, the, the tax that would be, uh, that, be, that would end revenue from government for that 51% of your economy would be high. So it would mm. reduce the percentage that oil is for your national budget or your state budget do you get it now do you, mm -hmm. get it? Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and, but because mm -hmm. it is low, low productivity services there is not much tax revenue coming out of it so mm -hmm. the main source of revenue for government remains oil right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. anything between 78 percent to 80 percent sometimes more than 80 percent can be what oil contributes to the national mm -hmm. budget that the president takes to the national assembly to mm. to, to to appropriate for him right and then the, mm -hmm. the other part of it is that oil represents more than 90 percent of the foreign exchange that you need in your you that we generate in our in our economy 
Hmm. And in one commodity generates more than 90% of the exchange. So it means that our export of any other thing is so low that it is insignificant. That is that is that is what makes oil very important for the for the country. And so this is what we must change. So to our topic on technology, technology can be the way through which we would change it. Because in technology, we already see that there are some of our young people in the tech industry that are already earning money in, in foreign currency. They, they, mm. they, they are operating in Nigeria, but their revenue is coming as, as, uh, as, as foreign currency. So, so mm. we already have innovations that are happening, uh, whether it is um, you know, uh, companies like Andela or companies like uh, Flutterwave, or the uh, you know uh, the the all the other things in between them that that exist uh, you know mm. I, I, I I see a number of these um, I, I see a number of these uh, tech companies that are that are coming to life uh, those in the fintech uh, space mm. they they are going mm. to be earning plenty of currency what we need yeah. to do is to support that ecosystem to begin to gradually grow until it mm. gets to the point where it overtakes oil. Uh, if, if there is one huge thing that we have, it is a huge colony of people in the diaspora. The diaspora mm. receipts also uh, constitute an important factor for us. But we have mm. not structured the receipts that we get from the diaspora. So most of the diaspora resources that come into their country or our continent go toward consumption. So the diaspora mm. are actually subsidizing government. Uh, because they are the ones providing social safety net for mm. the poor in the society, mm. you know. Yes. Yes. Mm. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much, Ma. Um, Ma, I'll, I'll go to the softer side of our question. What is your most trusted tech device? <laughs> I don't want to say. <laughs> it's my it's my iPhone. You know, you know, it's so funny. It, it's so yeah. funny. Well, if you know what it took, if you know what it took for my children to get rid of my um, of my BlackBerry. Oh my God! I actually yeah. suffered a withdrawal syndrome when they, when they, <laughs> when, they <laughs> when they insisted that I must yeah. migrate to. They said they couldn't see a future with BlackBerry. That BlackBerry was going well. into extinction. And I debated yeah. it with them. I said, it's not going into any extinction. Leave it to me. I'm comfortable with it. We, I mean, it was a fight to get me off yeah. my BlackBerry. You know, but, mm. you know, they, thought, they, they won. I lost. <laughs> I <Yeah>. lost. <laughs> Technology won. <laughs> they did win. So, they did what, win. Yeah. What, what, book, what book are you reading, right? <sighs> I have to tell you that I am not reading any book round. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that I am reading right now is I'm reading my Bible. Uh, I wanted to say Bible, uh, cover, I, I, no, no, and I and I don't mean again as though I, I was not reading it before. But I'm I'm just sort of focused on certain 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 books in my in the Bible right now that I, I am reading mm -hmm. in order to understand where we really are in terms of you know. So I see all of these things happening around me uh, physically mm -hmm. uh, around the world and all of that and i'm saying what time is it spiritually what is the lord saying to us at this mm. time what is it mm. that you know i mean the god is the creator so he's not caught on our ways about what yes. is going on around us um, yes. what is it what what is the what is this season saying to the creation uh, you know mm. so god created us and gave us the capacity to create when the world yeah. begins to go like this, what kind of creative, um, you know, uh, dimension does he expect of us? So I'm spending yeah. my time, you know, just reading the Bible uh, a lot and then doing yeah. my normal work. Um, uh, but, yeah. um, you know, um, any time of the day, um, I, I always um, read a lot of biographies of, of, yeah. of, of people who solved problems uh, in the yes. different uh, fields of um, endeavor. And then I, I spend a lot of time reading my um, uh, economic policy books. Mm, mm. My, my, what's your favorite food? What's my favorite food? Food. My favorite. Oh God! I, you know. Um, so 
any time of the day you will um yeah, you would would you would put my my and um put um plantain on the plate i would yes. be tempted to touch it <laughs> <laughs> <That's good. laughs> uh, how about how about your favorite food your quotation the one that, that drives you yeah pardon your favorite quotes your quotation that drives you that you look at and you, that drives so Your whole yes, I, I I do I do talk a lot about my dad, you know. So my dad, the, a lot of my dad's quotes uh, are things that I have lived with most of my life. So one that I constantly uh, talk about is uh, that my father says that character is not complete until it is consistent. Character is character is not complete until it is consistent. Wow! Wow! That that's wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank you. That that's character. It has to be consistent. Otherwise, it's not character. Yeah. It's not wonderful. complete until it is consistent. Yes. Yes. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, ma. We've had an enlightening <laughs> session with you, and we do hope we, we've won an award for you. I mean, um, they bring back our girls who won an award at the Gage Awards, and uh, so we have to find a way after the COVID nineteen to send it over to you. Um, thank okay. you so much. You, you were out of the country actually when we I think you were in Germany. Then when we had the whole ceremony and we kept it safe okay. in the office room. Thank you so much, Excellent. ma. So, and we and you're we welcome. hope to have more conversation with you. Very good, and I am glad that you're doing what you're doing in the technology space. Uh, no matter mm. what the difficulties may be, stay with it. Don't mm. don't prance up and do something else. Don't don't Thank get so into much. the transactions mindset. Uh, what mm. the continent needs, the continent and our country, we need builders. We need people who who can who can stand the the test of time. We need people mm. who don't get who don't get intimidated by the challenges of life, no matter mm. what it is. Say to them, bring it on, bring it on. Thank <laughs> you just, so much. Just... <laughs> we, are, we are running with you. We are running with you. Thank you so much, man. It's, it's a great time with you, man. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.